this Palm Sunday, the story is most familiar. And yet, your truth and your love abound and open new doors and new perspective for us. We ask for those great gifts now as we ponder this very familiar story. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. From Matthew 21. When they had come near Jerusalem and had re reached Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of the Lord.
text, there's always been a little something that has uh, <coughs> troubled me in previous years. How can Jesus ride two animals at the same time? You ever notice that? Yeah. He rode on a donkey and then on the colt, the foal of the donkey. What Matthew is doing in that text is quoting from Zechariah. And if you look at Zechariah closely, it is, he rode in on a donkey, comma, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Matthew, here's one of those places in scripture where you can see an error in Matthew's <coughs> reading of the Old Testament because the comma turns into and a colt, the foal of a donkey, so they're two animals instead of one. Don't get tripped up on that. That's a sideline, it's a sidebar, it's a little extra for nothing at this morning's sermon. So I did want to address that because that's been something in the back of my mind. But this morning we're going to be looking at both scripture and then some historical accounts of what was happening that are reported by the Jews out of the Bible and also by the Romans outside of the Bible. There are two processions, really, that enter into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday in the year 30 AD. One rose from a dusty trail off to the east of Jerusalem, up from the road from Jericho, and into the city proper near the gate of the temple. It was a procession of people largely comprised of peasants, people who had followed Jesus for weeks as he got closer and closer to Jerusalem. And so these are the people who are so excited. They have seen the miracles. They recently had seen the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 and themselves, many of them, had been fed by that miracle. It's helpful for us to realize that for this group, the term Hosanna is not so much a joy filled, although there was that present. It also, Hosanna literally means Lord deliver us, Lord save us. And they saw in Jesus coming in from, from the east, the Messiah who they expected. As Mike said, it was more of an expectation of a political or military messiah, someone who would deliver them from Rome and deliver them from any other problems that they had. Along with that processional were 12 followers. We know them as the disciples. And they were heading from the east straight into town and very near where the temple was, and they were heading directly to the temple. Now, the historical documents from both the Jewish writer Josephus and also the writers of the Roman histories also said there was another procession. It was coming in from the west. It was more powerful than that other one, although less populated. It was more regiment and organized, more ominous in appearance because it was a procession of Roman troops marching in step with weapons glinting in the sun. Flags of the empire were flying in the breeze as row upon row of soldiers marched from the west that morning, facing the rising sun to the east, maybe hearing off in the distance a loud clamor they carried, carried imperial banners with the metallic eagle perched on the top and the face of the Roman Empire painted. At the head of this group is Pontius Pilate, the governor. He's come from a town called Maritime Caesarea. And he is coming into town because the Passover is a time for the last 15 years that has been a very tumultuous time in the town of Jerusalem. You see, the city of Jerusalem in that day and time had about 40,000 inhabitants. But on Passover, it grew to a city of 200,000 people for that week. 
That's the group, a large group of people who are following this processional of Jesus into town. They expect something, a showdown. And the Romans expect something because they'd seen it for several years now where there would be an uprising of the temple. And out of the temple would come a disturbance in the whole community. So they had an entire garrison coming in to meet the challenges that Passover every year presented. On the east end of town, there was this joyful, expectant celebration of the one coming in who was the Messiah. Most of the people on the east end of town would have been thrilled to recognize that finally the Messiah was arriving. On the west end of town, there were other people who were celebrating, those who were shopkeepers and the politicians and the temple leaders who saw peace coming down the road in the form of an army who would keep the peace for the people. And once again, with the arrival of these people who had oversight over the whole process in Jerusalem, maybe, just maybe, they'd make it through the whole week without some kind of riot going on in their city. In that group, though, there were probably a few zealots planted there. They were the religious radicals who would look and try to figure out how to create a real uprising and destroy and overthrow the Roman influence. They probably were assessing this, this processional coming in from the West. How strong are they? How many people would it take to overthrow them? We cannot understand this tension that goes on and what happens with Jesus' entry in Jerusalem unless we also recognize that there was this other processional going on and that it was a time of great turmoil. The real drama of this story must include that Roman presence. It wasn't all about palm branches and children singing. Oh yes, there were lots of followers from the surrounding countryside <clears throat> who were mixed in that crowd. A large majority of folks who followed him from all over the region. But at best it was a precarious and an uneasy peace during that week. You see, the Roman army was tolerated and succumbed to because they recognized without it, it could be a powder keg in Jerusalem and things would just take off and become very tempestuous. The Romans, though, had a religion of worshiping multiple <coughs> gods, their eating habits, their political domination of the Hebrew people was perceived as a necessary evil at best. And most recognized that the Roman power was too great to overthrow by Judah itself. And so with the arrival of Jesus, many feared this uneasy peace between Rome and Jerusalem would become a powder keg. <coughs> many inhabitants of Jerusalem were disturbed that Jesus would upset the uneasy balance that they had spent decades creating under Roman rule. The Gospel writer Matthew attests to this in his use of the word that we interpret turmoil. Look there in verse 10 or 11 where it says the whole city was in turmoil. Now the Greek word for that word turmoil is esaisthe. Now that's a strong Greek word and it comes to us in a form that we recognize as seismic which means earthquake. This was tumultuous of earthquake proportions to the city of Jerusalem that they would have this kind of turmoil going in the city with the arrival of Jesus on one side and the Romans on the other. 
Many were disturbed that this Messiah had come to threaten their traditional ways and upset their own authority and power. They were the ones who either had lots of money or who were the political leaders. And certainly when we look up near the top of the Jewish authority, we can see many of them who were threatened <coughs> and the loss of their traditional privileges. Jesus was without a doubt a disturbing presence in Jerusalem. It's quite accurate to say that his impact on Jerusalem had seismic consequences. You know, in a number of ways, we can relate to all of what goes on during that week. We live with a certain turmoil within our own lives on one hand, on this day, we celebrate the arrival of Jesus into town and we shout our loud hosannas and we put our palms in. And then we sing the hymns and we go home and we begin Monday. And on Monday, we have to make some hard choices in our lives. We have said that Jesus is Lord of our lives and we will give him allegiance. But on Monday, it's harder to say that when to make political decisions or make <coughs> professional decisions <coughs> that might be cost effective in our lives may mean we have to compromise our relationship with Christ. You see, the house divided that Jesus entered into in Jerusalem is one that we live within our own lives. And maybe it's one that we see when we consider how much of our free time and money we shell out for entertainment and computer games and novels and alcohol and you name it, other forms of self-indulgence. Oh yes, I'm involved in that list. CNN, although lately it's been a challenge to watch. Others, computer, books, things that I like to give my life to and my time to, am I compromising my relationship with Christ? Is he really Lord, the first in the center of the temple of my life? The triumphal entry invites us to ponder that question. What would it mean if you invited him into the center of every decision you make? harder question. Oh yeah, it's an awful lot easier to stand on the margins and to wave our palm branches and say Jesus is Lord on Palm Sunday and to come back on Easter Sunday and say Jesus is Lord, he's resurrected Lord. But have we engaged in the passion of the week where the challenges that he makes are reflected in our lives every day. That's certainly a choice that all of us need to make and a choice that we are pondering every day of our lives. If we try to make him the center of our lives on this Palm Sunday, we might too find that he deeply troubles the equilibrium we have created for ourselves. What would it mean if the love and self-giving compassion of Jesus governed the way that we related to husband and wife throughout the week, to parent and child, to brother and sister in our own families? What would it mean if we brought Jesus into the center of our business decisions, our treatment of customers, our relationships with colleagues and fellow employees? Jesus wants to ride into the center of each of our lives whether it be in the boardroom or the classroom, whether it be in the field of sports or the dorm room, whether it be while we're surfing the net or when we're purchasing some latest fashion or geeky gadget, Jesus wants to be there. Do we want him there is the question we have to ask on Holy Week. As we see the parade route that he takes into town and challenges the temple and those who hoard money, those who make 
their livelihood based on the guilt and the sin offerings of others. It's not so easy to say, welcome into my life, Jesus, when he challenges our own values, and indeed he does every day. There are two separate processionals that enter into Jerusalem. One of them supports the status quo, keeps the peace, tries to enforce a political authority over any unrest that may happen to arise. The other one comes in and presents to us a challenge to our way of living, a triumphal entry on the back of a donkey when a real king would be riding in a Mercedes challenge to our ethics, to our choices, to our values. This is the man we follow this week. And it might be easier for us, rather than to stand on the sidelines and shout, and then come back and shout, resurrection. Might be better if we were to stand back a little bit from the edge of that crowd and take a hard look at what he really means to be in the center of our lives, to enter into the center of our temples. I invite you to enter into Holy Week with a deeper reverence and a more ponderous question in your own hearts this week. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. <coughs> Please stand and join with me as we affirm our faith together. <coughs> we trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. Amen. Please be seated. As we enter in to this holy week, we bring to God that which God has given us first, our gifts of love and gratitude.
We watch the processional going by and acknowledge our place in it, not only to praise, but also to be guided by. Use our lives and these gifts that we may be guided by your truth every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Son and God the Holy Spirit, be and abide with us all, now and forevermore. <laughs> 